I want to talk today about uh, one step from victory. One step from victory. And uh, Joshua chapter 1, I'm reading uh, verses 1 through 5 to you. And uh, praying the Lord will speak to our hearts and help us get that one step where we can go into victory. Joshua chapter 1. It says, Now after the death of Moses, a servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore, uh, uh, arise and go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, into the land which I do give unto them, even to the, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness... And this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun, shall be your coast. There shall not be any man able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so will I be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide the inheritance of the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the Bible. <clears throat> thank you all that it gives us every truth we ever need, Father, for godliness. You've given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished into all good works. We thank you that we have the answers in the Bible. Thank you for everybody who's come today, for a good crowd, despite people being gone. And we just thank you um, for every person here. They're each an important, precious soul that'll live forever, that'll live in defeat or victory. And Lord, I pray today that they would, they would, first of all, all be saved and uh, trust the Lord Jesus Christ. And after that, every one of them would know the victory and uh, would enter in. We pray you'd speak in a great way. I give you myself, I give you my mind and my tongue and everything. And I ask you, as we just sang, uh, take my life and let it be. And uh, may everything that I have be yours, that you would speak to our hearts and the word of God be powerful and we'd be changed. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, I believe in victory. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ <clears throat> being able to give us victory. I believe in the power of the Word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit and what God can still do in lives today. I believe you can have victory. I believe you don't have to be in defeat. The devil will tell you you are going to constantly be like this. This is the rest of your life, but it is not the rest of your life unless you choose it to be. You can be more than a conqueror, the Bible says, through him that loved us. If God be for us, who can be against us? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We can have victory. Any one of us can have victory. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. But thanks be to God which always giveth us a victory. Uh, all those verses, Romans 8, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, Philippians chapter 4, it's all over the Bible that God can give you victory. But a lot of people live one step from victory. They live with the desire. They live with, a, with some uh, a change and some good things happen in their life. But to be more than a conqueror, a lot of people don't actually enter into that. And that's, look, God has that for you. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Um, this, in this story, you have Israel. Israel is... Uh, They'd, they'd come out of Egypt, great victory. <clears throat> but then they began, after the Red Sea and after coming into the, <clears throat> into the uh, area, the region around the Promised Land, they went up to Kadesh Barnea and sent the spies in. And then the spies went in, spied out the land, <clears throat> and that land was uh, there for them. It was a beautiful land flowing with milk and honey and all those things. But they came back with an evil report and said, we can't do this. These enemies are too powerful. <clears throat> there is walled cities. There's giants. And we can't go in. And God became very disgusted with them. And he says, none of you are going to go in. Except for the two people who said, we can go in. And that was Joshua and Caleb. The rest of them had to go and begin wandering. God says, I'm going to have you wander in the wilderness until you die off. And, and because I'm going to have the next generation go in and let them have victory. And everyone 20 years old and upward uh, 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 <clears throat> was, was wandering for 40 years. They died off. And then the younger people with Joshua and Caleb were brought up to the border of the promised land. But, but, but 
um, all those tw- uh, 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 19 and younger. And that's why I, I kind of, when, when people, a biblical date for adulthood, I think 20 is a, is a good accountable date for adulthood in most cases. I think that's variable by the person and by the situation, things like that. But I think that is <clears throat> a good break free where you're not under your parents anymore and you might move out before then, but, but where you're not under your parents' authority necessarily, um, but where you sound accountable to God yourself. Um, that's debatable, um, but 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 I think that's what what happened in this case, and we see that in this in this story, um, we see that they they just begin to wander and wander and wander, and then they finally they end up with with Moses dying, the generation that, that didn't go in that didn't believe in the victory dying, <clears throat> and they go up, and they're camped on the other side of the Jordan River, and God said, hey, when you cross Jordan, that's really the promised land. The promised land, I want to say, had wonderful things in it. Incredible richness and wealth and blessings and farms waiting for them to take over. And God was going to help them go in. Everything was was wonderful. There was a rich land, a blessed land. And they wouldn't have to build the farms. They wouldn't have to build, plant the, 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 the vines. Everything was there. They would just take it over and, and defeat their enemies. And God had this wonderful land flown with milk and honey. But there was also enemies there that were very powerful. They had walled cities. Big giant walls made of stone, uh, very hard to conquer. They had giants in the land. There were people that were, you know, nine feet tall and powerful warriors, people of war, people who had fought year after year. They were trained in war. Israel was not trained in war. And so I want to say, in your victory, it's the same situation. You've got an amazing life in Christ there. It's a wonderful land. In the Bible, these things are all pictures. Uh, uh, Egypt is a picture of the world. You leave the world. You cross the Red Sea. That's the blood of Christ. That's salvation. You enter, you leave the world, and you come in in salvation and baptism through the Red Sea. And you come in salvation and baptism, and then God takes you up to the promised land and says, enter into the victorious Christian life. The promised land is a picture of the victorious Christian life. But many don't enter in. Because two things. One, the victorious Christian life is awesome. Number two, it's a battle to get there. And a lot of people aren't willing to face a battle, and they do not believe God can bring them in there. So they never really go into the mighty, victorious, supernatural, amazing Christian life. They live in the wandering, okay, I'm not in Egypt anymore, but I'm just kind of wandering around life. Now, wandering around is amazing. Uh, They got manna from heaven. They got water from the rock. They had God guiding them with the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud, and and they saw miracles, and and that's the average Christian. God's pretty good to them. They have a pretty good life. They're not not quite in the world anymore, and they're they're born again, but why do you want to wander in mediocrity when you can go into greatness? But most people don't go into the greatness. And, and, and here's Joshua in Joshua chapter 1, and Joshua is taken over. Moses is dead now. He said, Joshua, you're the leader now. And Joshua, I'm going to give you instructions of how to go in. You need to cross Jordan with this multitude and go in and get the victory. And I'm going to give you instructions. And he's telling him how to get in there. And, and he's right on the edge. He's right there. He's right on the edge of the promised land. And God's telling him how to do it and how to get in there. And that's where many of you are. You're one step away from the promised land. But that step's a big step. They were one step away before. But they doubted God and they didn't go in. And you are one step away from going to the promised land. And so many people get right to the edge of really going, and God's pushing you in to the new level, to the new greatness, the new mighty works for God, and, and, and living in miracles, and living in God's working, and God's pushing you in there. And he says, go, go on in. It's right there. <clears throat> and you're not far. But a lot of people don't take that step. A lot of people stay on the edge of the promised land. And I don't want you to do that. Because, it, can I tell you, the promised land's awesome. Serving God in victories, there's no greater life, no greater accomplishments, no greater rewards in heaven, and and, and you can go in. But they, so many don't go in. Why didn't they go in? I'm just going to give you some reasons they did not go in. 
And these will include also how to go in. I'm just going to give you uh, four points. The first three points are things maybe I've preached a little bit before. The fourth one is the one I want to focus on a little bit more time. First reason they didn't go in is because they did not trust the Lord enough. That's it. Pretty simple. Uh, chapter 1 and uh, verse 5, it says, There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so will I be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. His going in was contingent on God's ability to take care of him. God said, I'm going to go with you, and if I'm with you, I won't fail you. That's the same God who's alive today. He will not fail you nor forsake you. He doesn't leave you. He doesn't say, go on in, and then he leaves you to go in there alone. But it's all contingent, he says, on me going with you. And then Joshua chapter 1 and verse 9, Have not I commanded to be strong and of good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. We have a reference that, that refers back to um, the first time they didn't go in and the people who, the generation that didn't get to go in and, it, and God, it really bothered God. God names the day. It's such a big deal to God. God keeps going back to it throughout the whole Bible. It's called a provocation. It provoked God to anger when they did not trust him enough to go in. Let me take you all the way to Hebrews. God's still talking about it in the New Testament, in the book of Hebrews, about how much it's bothered him that they would not trust him enough to go in. <clears throat> they would not trust him enough to go in. The insult that was to God, and that, that, that they didn't trust the Lord enough. In Hebrews, and uh, we have in chapter uh, 3, and uh, verse 17, But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom gave he, uh, swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not. So then they could not enter in because of their unbelief. Let us therefore fear, lest the promise of being uh, 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 left us, of being entered into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. There it is again. He says a couple things here. He says, some come short of it. Let's be careful that we don't do that. But God calls it in here in this chapter over and over in verse 1, in verse 3, in chapter 3, verse 18, in down in verse uh, 8, uh, chapter 4, verse 8, chapter 4, verse 9, chapter 4, verse 10, and chapter 4, verse 11. He calls it a rest. He says, they couldn't enter into my rest. Why? Because God sees the promised land as a rest. Why? Because once you've conquered your enemies, you inherit all the blessings. And the promised land in the Christian life is when you go in, you conquer what's holding you back, and you overcome them, and then the spiritual life is a rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn to be my, uh, for a meek and lowly heart. Ye shall find rest for your souls. In the will of God, in the plan of God, in the victory of God, is a rest for your souls. But a lot of people come short of it. Why? They could not enter in because of their unbelief. They didn't believe God can give them the victory over those giants. They didn't believe God could give them the victory over the walls and the enemies that are all there. We focus too much on ourselves or our problems and not enough on the Lord's abilities. Most people who failed fail because of one of two things. One, they look at themselves too much and think, I can't do this because of what I am. That's the first group of people who fail. The second people who f group of people who fail is they focus too much on their problems and their enemies and their giants in the land. And you look and say, but, but I have this problem. If I do this, then, but I have these relatives who don't know the Lord, and they're going to hold me back. If I go in, I'm going to have this thing and this problem. I'm going to fail at this thing again. But I've got my addictions. But I've got my, 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 my weaknesses. I've got, and, and they focus on these things. They focus on the giants. They focus on the walled cities, which are real. The giants you have to face and the walled cities you have to face, they are on the promised land. The promised land is hard to get in. You've got to conquer some enemies. But when you turn your focus to God instead of yourself or your problems, you become Joshua and Caleb who had the faith to go in. 
but we're too busy focusing on other things. And your giants seem so big when you focus on them. Then you begin to say, this can't happen. This won't happen. And you can't enter in because of your unbelief, because you should be focusing on God. I have not been as much lately able to get out in the nature as I like to get in the nature. I find it mentally and spiritually healthy to go out into God's creation. The heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament showeth his hand and handiwork. Day and a day of utter speech, night and night showeth knowledge. There is no place where their voice is not heard. Nature speaks of God's creation. I find that when people are always in the city and always around man's creation, that's where all the atheists hang out because they don't see what God made. You look at nature, you realize this couldn't happen by accident. But it also, as you see in like the song, How Great Thou Art, you see how amazing God's creation is. And the other night, I, it, the, the, <clears throat> the other night, you wouldn't believe it, a miracle happened, and the sky cleared. And I could see these things in the sky called stars. We had 80 days of clout. It was a record. It was amazing. And I looked up and I saw a star up there, and it's a big, bright star. And I don't know what that star is. I don't know if it's one of our planets in our in our solar system. I don't know if it's a uh, if it's a galaxy somewhere. I don't know if it's a I don't know what that star is. Look at that star. That star is big and huge, and God made it. And that's my God, who can overcome anything in my life. And you see God, and you look at the mountains, and you say God just spoke it, and the oceans, and God. And God made him in the universe and the galaxies. And you, when you begin to focus on God, your giants don't seem so big. When you focus on your giants, you will be amazed how they'll seem insurmountable. And you think, even God can't help me with this. You're focusing the wrong thing. You're focusing the wrong thing. Their unbelief made him. They did not believe God could give them the victory over those walled cities, over Jericho, over the giants. They did not believe God could do it. And what an insult. What an insult to say, God, you can't help me overcome these things. You can't help me be a conqueror. You can't overcome these sins in my life. You can't overcome my, my giants. What an insult to God. And God uses, all right, don't go in then. I'm not forcing you in. Joshua, you're on the edge of the promised land. Go in. I'll be with you. But you got to believe God. You got to believe and quit focusing on yourself. Quit focusing on your problems. Quit focusing on your past. Go to somewhere new with God. Go into the promised land and believe God is greater than your weaknesses. Enter in. But you got to believe God. The first reason they did not get in is because they did not trust the Lord enough. It's that simple. They did not trust the Lord enough, and that'll keep you from going in. Number two, it takes strength and courage. It takes, takes strength and courage. This is a big concern of mine that I, that I, that I, I find in this having to deal with because um, we, we are raising generations now that have never had to overcome anything and be strong. Whenever something is hard, there's a pill. There's a government program. There's something, something to take care of them. And they've, their parents, there's, there's participation awards, and their parents will say, it's okay, I'll do this for you. And people do not know how to be strong anymore. And the truth is, God's going to go with you and give the victory, but you have to be strong and courageous. And we see this in, in, in uh, chapter 1 and verse 6 here. It says, Be strong and of good courage. For this, unto this people shalt thou divide for the inheritance, which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that I have written unto thee. Verse 9, Have not I commanded thee, Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. He says, look, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to give the victory, but you have to be strong and courageous. You have to do that part. It will be hard. So the word strong there is kazak in the Hebrew. The word means to fasten upon. Strongly grip something and hang on to it. It also means to conquer. 
look, you're going to have to be strong. You have to grab a hold of this thing, Joshua, because you're going to have challenges. You're going to have bad days. You're going to have some failures. You're going to have some enemies, and you have to grab a hold of this thing and not let go of it. You have to be strong. It's not going to be easy. You're going to be pulled on, and if you're not gripping, if you're not holding on, you're not going to make it. Be strong. Don't quit. Be strong. Be courageous. The first thing is strong. The second thing is courage. You're going to leave your current place behind. You're going into an unknown land. You're going to face enemies that are stronger than you. You have questions unanswered. God says something, the verse that meant the world to me two years ago in Joshua chapter 3 and verse 4, when I had to do some things in the ministry and God led me and pushed me out into where I've never gone before and I couldn't find anybody who'd done exactly what we needed to do. And God gave me this verse and it meant so much to me in Joshua chapter 3 and verse 4. It, should, it says, yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 uh, cubits of measure. Come not near unto it, that ye may know the way by which ye must go, for ye have not passed this way heretofore. And he says, look, the ark of God's going to go first, and, and you stay back there, and it's going to guide you, because you've never been here before. Now, let me just talk to you about something important in your life you need to understand here. <clears throat> You are given what's handed to you by your family and by your circumstances you grew up. And that is mostly parameters for most people. That's what their life is going to be in that realm without God. You usually stay in somewhere in the parameters of which is familiar to you. The, the type of home you had, whether you want it or not, you end up usually having that type of home. It, it just, you just had those parameters. That's a natural thing is to follow what you grew up with. And that's just that. And that's... But that is not a guarantee. That's just the normal. I don't have that in my life. I'm in a completely different house and home and life than I grew up with because of the Lord Jesus Christ. But here's the thing I want, I want to say that, that I've seen a thousand times over, uh, and literally a thousand times in ministry, in children's ministry, in, in the gangs of Chicago, in, in, in inner cities, in, in, in people, in every circumstance, with drug addicts, with jails, with people, and all these things, is <clears throat> it is very hard to take someone out of their failure if they're used to it. It's very hard to take someone to a new realm, even if their old realm is bad. It's very hard to take a peop people who've always been in poverty. It's very difficult to take them into non-poverty. You say, no, they want to be rich. They want to be rich, but they've been comfortable and poor. And people will stay comfortable in misery if it's secure. They're used to abusive relationships, and they will continue to be in abusive relationships. Why? Strangely enough, it's what they're used to. Alcoholics breed alcoholics. Why? Because they're used to that lifestyle. And, and, and people who grew up in violence will continue the violence because why? It's what they're used to. It's what their norm is, and that's where you are. And for you to come out of the misery and the bad hand you were dealt, you're going to have to go to new realms where you're not comfortable. You're going to have to go to new places and make decisions that are going to take you to where you've not been before, and it's new, and new isn't always easy. Look, going into a, going to meet new people, going to a new church, it's just going somewhere new is not easy, right? And you go to the, a new job, your first day at your job, you're, well, what it's going to be like, what... It's just hard to go new. Some people will stay the same miserable job. You know why? Because they're used to it. And they know what it's like. And the monster they know is a lot better than the monster they don't know. Even if it's a monster. Because they're worried about the other monster. Might be scarier. And you know what? It's, you're going to have to leave and be courageous to take yourself and your family out of your norm. 
It's not easy. The monster they know is what? The monster they know is, is safer than the monster they don't know. It takes strength. It takes courage. Courage of leaving your current place behind. You've been wandering for 40 years in the same wilderness. We know how to live here. We know how to eat here. We know how to do things here. We've been here for 40 years. In there, how do we fight? How do we? We haven't been at war yet. Yeah, you have to learn some new stuff. But God's with you. And it's uncomfortable. Why don't most people go in? One, because they do not trust the Lord enough. Number two, because it takes strength and courage. It's going to be hard, and it'll take courage to leave your current place and go into the unknown. But the unknown is a lot better. The victorious Christian life and doing great things for God, and in a new realm of victory, <clears throat> it's not what you're used to, but it's awesome. You say, what am I going to do if I, if I move from this dumpy apartment to the 10-bedroom to the house? How will I fill it up? Look, that's a better problem. <laughs> then why, how do I not kill my neighbor who's killing each other and listen to the music? And I'm saying in, in the victorious Christian life, when you really go into victory and really become a real Christian and really start serving God and going to church all the time and winning souls to Christ and, and, and having a clean life and, and influencing people and, and God's using you and all that stuff— it's awesome. But you're going to have to be strong to get there, and you're going to have to be courageous to go in. Number three, you want to go in there? Let's go back to Joshua 1. You want to go into the promised land. Why don't most people go in? Because you've got to live in the word of God. <clears throat> you have to live in the word of God. Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. That thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then shalt thou make thy way prosperous, and then shalt thou have good success. He says, when you get the Bible into you, and you live in the Bible, you begin to prosper and have success. But he says, you got to live in this book. It shall not depart out of thy mouth. You'll meditate in it day and night. Then... Shalt thou have good success. Then your way will be prosperous. Psalms 1 says the same thing. But in his law do thee meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. If you, I'm just going to tell you, you want to have a victorious Christian, you got to spend a lot of time in the Bible. A lot of time in the Bible. Meditate there in day and night, as the Bible says. I just want to tell you something. I've seen this a million times. When you go and you live in the Bible, I mean, you don't just go hear it on Sunday. You read it every day, and you meditate on that. You put it in your, in your, in your car and on the, on the Bluetooth, and you play it out loud. You put it in your earbuds sometimes, and you just spend a bunch of time in the Bible. And when, maybe you're, you're listening to sermons and other things, and when you're not listening to it, you're thinking about it. I'm just telling you, if you could have a steady Bible diet throughout the day, you will find God begins to bless your life. You begin to have success and prospering in every area of your life. Things just change. I'm not saying you don't have another problem. I'm not saying that you don't ever hit traffic again. You're in Seattle, okay? I understand that, but you know what? You know how most of the time you say, why did it happen? It always goes just like that. Why did this happen then? And things just always go wrong. You'll find yourself being blessed and being surprised how right it went. And you know, it's a pleasant thing to say, hey, that went really good. You know, God says he's going to bless your way if you'll spend time in the word of God, but you're not going in. You're not going to the promised land without the word of God. Without not a, a steady, constant diet of it. And, and, and listen, <clears throat> you've got an opportunity, and I've got an opportunity to whom much is given, much is required. And, and I want to say this. You've got an opportunity historically nobody's ever had. You know what the opportunity is? If you wanted to read your Bible all the time, you couldn't do it through most of your jobs. The Bible was a very precious book that very few people had throughout history. And, and, and you had to take care of your copy. And you couldn't listen to it all the time. And you couldn't work with your hands and listen to the Bible. Now, you got the Bible on everything. You can listen to the Bible. You can listen to preaching. You can listen to the Word of God in so many ways. You can have it digitally. You can put it in a CD. Uh, you, can, you, can, you can put it in a, uh, you, can, you can put it on your earbuds and your Bluetooth and your phone. <clears throat> and I know 
You have your phone with you. <laughs> you know, I've seen, you know, <clears throat> I've seen you when you lost your phone. It is not like, hey, I lost my phone, but no biggie. That's not what it's like. It is. I, I'm going to call 911 if I don't find this thing soon. Everybody, hey, my phone. Uh. You're digging, turning things upside down. You used to be disabled. You said, I'm disabled. Now, not when you're looking for your phone. You're abled. <laughs> it's amazing how disabilities go away when you lose your phone. You'll, you, you're lifting your couch. Nope, not under there. And I mean, you'll look everywhere. It's crazy. You know, you can put that Bible on your phone really easy. I did it. If I can do it, you can do it. Okay? And you can put your Bible on your phone and play it when you're driving, when you're walking down the street, when you're on the bus. Don't listen to the crazies. Listen to the Bible. And spend time in the Word of God. You have this opportunity where you can have the Bible everywhere you go. You can listen to Bible sermons. You can, and it's amazing. Look, everybody in our church should read their Bible through every year. You can listen to it. On the way back and forth from work, you can listen to it. And finish your Bible through. You're in this opportunity where the Word of God is everywhere and easy to have access to. And, and let me tell you, It'll start changing your life, and you'll begin to see blessings from God. But don't think without the Bible, you're going to go into the promised land. This thing's vital. And, 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 and look, be steady in your diet of the Bible. Somebody said if we treated our Bibles like we treated our cell phones, Amen. we'd all have revival. Look, I have some things I do to help me make sure to the Bible. I don't drink coffee until I've read the Bible. I don't, I don't read anything else until I've read the Bible. I read the Bible. I, I do it. I read it physically in the morning and at night, okay? Because the Bible says uh, 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 a day and night. And so I do both those things. Um, but throughout the day, day, many times I'm listening to it. And, and if you're on social media, fine. I'm not against that. But just don't say you don't have, don't have time for the Bible. Okay? When you're on social media. Don't say you don't have time for the Bible if you read other books. Don't say you don't have time for the Bible. It, it won't. It, look, everything else you want to do will not be that hard. The Bible is going to be hard because the devil fights it. The devil is not fighting you off Snapchat and Facebook and Twitter. He's fighting you on. The de it, you can read your favorite book. You can read <clears throat> some spy book or war book or a Western or a romance. And you can read those things. And you'll find it, it's, this is great, you want to keep on picking it up. But the devil doesn't mind you reading those things. But to read the Bible, it's a choice you have to make to spend time in the Bible. He says, Joshua, you better have this Bible with you all the time. Day and night, meditate in it, and be in it, and live in it. Because you are in a war. And the promised land is for those who have the Bible in their hearts. Thy word have I hid in, my, uh, hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And so we see we've got to be in the Bible. We've got to live in the Bible. Read the Bible to your family. Spend time in the Bible. Live in the word of God. And we see blessings from that. That's why you got to go in the promised land. We said because uh, they didn't go in because they didn't trust the Lord enough. They didn't go in because it takes strength and courage. You got to decide to do it, not quit and grip and, and be courageous enough to take the step. You got to live in the Word of God. And the thing I really want to just focus on, the most important one, is you got to go in. <laughs> I was reading and, and, and I was laughing at this because God kept on saying, just go in. Let me take it uh, uh, to Deuteronomy back a little bit. And just show you how God is. And he, we got that in Joshua. I should have kept you there. But we'll read uh, Deuteronomy first and we're reading Joshua. You just got to go in. De Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verse 8. It says, Behold, I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land. Boy, you got to hear the message tonight on prayer. I'm going to talk about prayer tonight. And, and such a, a missing thing in prayer. It's so simple. But he says, I've given you the land. Go in and possess it. <laughs> I, I, I kept laughing at this because it's so simple. You want to go in the promised land? 
You got to go in the promised land. <laughs> he says, I've given you the land. Go in and possess it. It's there for you. You got to go in. Uh, chapter 4. Verse 1, now therefore, brethren, or hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and the judgments which I set before you, to do them that ye may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord thy God giveth you. He's given it to you. you got to go in. Chapter 9 and verse 1. <coughs> Hear, O Israel, thou art to pass over Jordan this day to go in to possess uh, the nations greater and mightier than thyself, cities great and fenced up to heaven. Hey, look, you got to cross Jordan to go get these victories. Chapter 11 and verse 8. Therefore shalt thou keep the commandment which I command you this day, that ye may be strong and go in and possess the land, and ye go in and possess it. And then back to Joshua, chapter 1. <clears throat> He says in verse uh, <clears throat> 2, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over to Jordan, thou and all the people, into the land which I do give them, the children of Israel. Arise and go over. Arise and go over. That is your part. Arise and go over. Verse 11. He says, pass through the host and command the people, saying, prepare you victuals, for within three days you shall pass over this Jordan and go to possess the land which the Lord thy God giveth you to possess it. Arise and go over. Do you see the pattern there? God says, I've given it to you. Go possess it. You've got to choose to go there. You've got to make the step. Now, here's the problem. Is a couple things that stop us from just going in. And, 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 and these are just such keys. From you, because God's got the victory. He we already quoted all the promises. But you have to go get it. Yes, amen. God's got the victory, but you have to go get it. Look, if, if, if the car dealer had said, hey, somebody bought you a $50,000 truck, come get it. I don't have the truck. But I'm dumb if I don't go get it. I got to go sign the papers and get the key. Right? And that's the Christian life. God says, I've given you the land, go in and possess it. But a lot of people sit back on the edge and say, mm, yeah, I don't think I can. I'm not going to. You know what? It takes some steps. It's going to be too hard to do this because the devil's going to throw you the complications because here's the problem. When God told Joshua to go in and possess it, Joshua had some obstacles. First obstacle was the Jordan River he had to cross was in flood stage. <laughs> Please listen to me. If this, the river is flooded, and we don't do this, but try to cross the river in flood stage on foot. Rivers are slippery. How many try to walk across a, a, a river a, a moving where the water's moving fast and the rocks are slippery? How many have done that before? Not easy, is it? <clears throat> Every old person just raised their hand, and no kids did. That's scary. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and you got to walk across. God says, go over and possess it. And that's the first thing, is to go, <laughs> to go in to victory. You can't sit there and try to figure every problem out. Let me talk to you overthinkers for a minute here. Because sweet, there are certain people who are overthinkers, and there are certain people who are not overthinkers. <laughs> overthinkers are wonderful. You're great at a bunch of things, and you figure things out and all that stuff. But you sometimes, you just got to get up and go do it. You can't figure everything out ahead of time. God does not solve most of your problems till you get up and start crossing Jordan. And God said, go over, cross, go over cross Jordan. And Joshua says, hmm, all right, let's go. Lord, just so you know, it's flooded. We can't walk across here. We've got women and children, but you said go, so we're going to go. Oh, what an important thing that is. Look at chapter 3 and uh, verse 14. They walked up to Jordan. The first people to go was the priests with the Ark of the Covenant on their shoulders. And they walked the river. And it came to pass, chapter 3, verse 14, when the people, when the people removed from their tents 
to pass over Jordan, and the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people. And as they bear the Ark, they that bear the Ark were come to Jordan, and the feet of the priest that bear the Ark were dipped in the brim of the water, for the Jordan overfloweth all its banks at this time of the, at the time of harvest, that the waters which came down from above stood up and rose up in a heap very far from this from the city of Adam. So understand that. Here's the priest, guys in front, they got the Ark of the Covenant. Everyone walks out of their tent. That means we're committed to this thing. The priests walk over to the flooded river, and it says their feet got wet. As soon as their feet touched the river, the river went whoosh, and stood up, and the ground became dry. And so the priest basically went like this whoosh, on dry ground. But the waters did not stand up till their feet touched the water. <laughs> and so you sit there and think, well, I would serve God if just this person I was married to did this. I would just serve God if I just had enough money. If I just had this job that was like this, I would just really have a victorious Christian life. If I just had this past, and if I could just figure out how to stop doing this, I would go into the Christian life. And how long have you been thinking and thinking and thinking? God parts the Red Seas for people going forward. God parts the Jordan for people who are stepping in it in faith, saying, God, you told me to cross this thing. We can't cross this, but I'm going to cross it. Then God parts it. And you say, man, I want to do this thing. I want to go in the ministry. But if, 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 if you want God to make everything work, worked out, and then you'll trust the Lord. That is not faith. You want God to bless you and then you'll follow him. God says, follow me and I'll bless you. You want to reap? You say, God, give me great crops and I'll go plant. <laughs> That's not how God works ever. Obedience brings blessings. Faith that says, I'm going to do it, God. And God says, all right, I'll start parting stuff for you. Not, as soon as you part stuff for me, I'll go in. Guys, if that river dries up, we're going over there and we're going to go in. And somebody say, Joshua, God told us to go in. He says, well, how do you expect me to go in? Look at the river. Just obey. Just obey. Don't sit and try to figure it all out. God might show you some answers ahead of time, but somewhere you're going to need faith. Somewhere you're going to need faith. Secondly, underneath, you got to go in. Don't First, don't sit and try to figure it all out. Secondly... You find God's answers along the way. Joshua 5. <clears throat> so Joshua crosses, they get the other side, and then there's this big walled city. Goodness, giant walls. They can never scale those walls. They can never knock them down. Lord, and by the way, listen, God starts you off with every great decision with a test to see if you're going to follow it through. You say that God wants me to do this, and then all of a sudden you start doing it, and God says, all right, let's make it hard. Let's see if you're strong and courageous. You're going to hold on to this thing. Everything goes wrong. Test time. Let's just test you ahead of time. See if you're going to go with it. Let's just see if you're going to do it. Joshua crosses over. Guess what he finds? He finds the water stands up. Then he's looking at Jericho going, Lord, how are we going to knock down those walls? They're so thick. They say they used to have chariot races across the top of the whole walls. They're so thick. Wow. How are you going to knock down those walls? You don't got battering rams. You, like, you don't have catapults. You don't have cannons. You're people with swords. And they're on the walls. They can throw rocks and boiling oil and everything down on you. But he obeyed. And in the middle of this time, he's contemplating what to do. And in chapter 5, <coughs> verse 13, And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, there stood a man over against him with a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us? Or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as captain of the Lord of the hosts, the captain of the hosts of the Lord, am I now come? And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto this servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose off thy feet, uh, the shoes off thy feet, for the place where the sand is, is holy. And Joshua did so. The one who had the sword in his hand, who's the captain of God's host, was standing there, and Joshua was going to meet him on that side of Jordan. 
Along the way, the answer to those walls came, and he said, walk around the city seven times. I'll make the walls fall down. I've already loosened all of the cinder blocks. I've already loosened all the concrete. You just walk around it. I get it all figured out. Our, our angels are going to blow the walls down. But he didn't find that answer on the other side of Jordan. He found it in the promised land. And your answers are going to be there when you go forward and do what God wants you to do and be courageous and say, I'm going to serve God with all my heart, with all my life. I'm going in. I don't know how I'm going to do this, Lord. You have to take care of this. And then you go in. And then God meets it along the way. Obedience bring ble brings blessings, not the other way around. When we got this call to the Philippines and God said, start a church. And I said, I'm barely keeping it together here. <clears throat> we did. Went to the Philippines. We started planning it out. And we had to have a pastor there. Where am I going to find a pastor? I can't have a young guy running the church. We're going to start. We got to have somebody else that are doing, and we got to have all the things we need, and and we got to have the workers, and we got to have this, and we got to have that. And how do I start a church in another country? And how do I keep it running? And all these things. But we went. And then a great pastor called me and said, Pastor, let me be your pastor on site. I'll do what you want. I'll run it like you want to. God's called me to do this for you. An experienced pastor, who's a successful pastor. I didn't call him. God had him there when he went. But if I had waited until I found a pastor to say, okay, okay, God, we're going, I wouldn't have found the pastor. I had to go. And everything we needed along that project, God just said, here's the, here's the thing. Go ahead. Just go forward. Just go forward. And here's what you need. And here's what you need. And we found that obedience brings a blessing of God. And you can go in, but you got to go in. <laughs> You gotta choose to go to church. You gotta choose to read your Bible. You gotta choose to spend time with God. You gotta choose to say, I'm gonna conquer these things. I'm not gonna live with this in my life anymore. I'm not gonna live at this spiritual level anymore. I'm gonna fight for God and I'm gonna go into the promised land. You gotta go in. God's got the victory there. But he doesn't get the victory when you're on the wrong side of Jordan thinking about it. Have you just decided I'm going in? I'm gonna serve God with all my heart the rest of my life. Whatever I can give to God, I'll give to God. Or are you still thinking it through? Waiting for Jordan to part. Waiting for the floods to go down. Waiting for the walls to fall down. Walls fall down when you get there. When you meet the Lord of the hosts. What it looks like, <clears throat> it looks like a Christian who says, I'm going to serve God with my life. I'm going to give God everything I have. I'm going to go into victory. I'm committed. I'm serious about God. I'm not going to be content with these sins in my life. I'm not going to be content with defeat. Lord, let's do this. Lord, help me to do this. And God will all of a sudden send you someone who says, hey, I'm praying for you. Can I help you with some things that I've overcome? <laughs> That's what I was wondering about. You'll just find once your decision is made and you determine and start doing it, you'll start finding God has the answers that you can't figure out. But you got to believe God. you got to have some faith. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the chance to preach the Bible today. Lord, thank you for the chance to talk about your victory. Lord, Philippians 4.13, still there. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Yet how few Christians go into the promised land of victory. How few people really know what it's like to be more than conquerors. Lord, today I pray some people will believe you. I pray some people would commit themselves to you no matter what. I pray they'd be strong and very courageous. I pray they'd live in the word of God, and I pray they'd go in. Quit thinking about it. Thank you for the Bible that tells us these things. Thank you for these truths, Lord. Thank you for the lives like Paul and Peter and others in the New Testament that went all in. Mary Magdalene, with all of her past, all the way in. Thank you, Lord, that you can do great things with us. I pray, Lord, that we'd enter in and just go in. Quit thinking about it. Quit staying out there. Quit making excuses. Quit trying to have everything worked out and trust you that you'll help us. Lord, we got to think and do our best, but we got to trust you. Help us, Lord. We pray today some people would enter in. I pray also that those who don't know you as Savior would come to know you as Savior. And may all of us be strong and courageous for you. Why would we not be strong and courageous when you're going to give us strength and when you can give us courage because you're with us? Lord, may we be strong and courageous. We pray these things in Jesus' name.